What are the biggest mistakes that executives and entrepreneurs make in their life as it relates to their mindset? Today, we're going to be finding out, we're going to be talking about business, personal development, how change comes from unlearning, it doesn't come from knowing more stuff, it actually comes from unlearning what we have learned. And we're going to talk about unlearning our limitations. Today's guest is a wonderful woman by the name of Britt Lefko, who is based out of Salt Lake City, Utah. She is a top mindset and behavioral change coach, and she works with the Google executive team that drives their innovation lab. And she also works with high achieving entrepreneurs and executives and athletes. And as we're soon to find out, she comes from very much a personal development coaching family. So she grew up understanding or learning and or possibly even reciting things to do with mindset change and behavioral change. It's a big welcome to Britt Lefko. Welcome, Britt. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. Great to have you here. Just for context for our listener, I saw Britt speak at an event uh, recently where she talked about mindset and leadership, and I invited her to come onto the uh, the program here. So Britt, just tell us a little bit about what you do and how long you've been doing it, and then we'll go from there. You got it. So um, like you just said, I focus on mindset and behavior change with high achievers. And what I really focus on are where are the blind spots that are keeping us stuck? Where are the places that we are in internal conflict? And internal conflict is really one part of you knows better and one part of you is stuck. So part of you is planning and visioning and dreaming. And that's the part of your brain that knows that you have to delegate in order to be successful or that you have to be able to focus on the high priority projects. And yet you find yourself behaving out of accordance with what it is that you actually want. So I help people to identify the specific beliefs and patterns and identities that are keeping them stuck. And then, like you said, to unlearn those so that they can have this internal resonance. And the the deeper we go, what I really find is there's a set of core values that really help us to run, whether it's your business or your life. And we get stuck because the limiting mindset we have is actually out of alignment with those values. And so step one is really unlearning those limitations. And then step two is really igniting a deeper sense of passion and alignment by living a life that is truly aligned with who you are and, and what it is you want. And second part of the question. Um, so also, like you said, I come from a very unique self-help family. My dad was a self-help guru back in the days. And as a little girl, like four or five years old, I was already introduced to these concepts. And so I've been doing this work my entire life. It's a part of my family, my DNA. I started doing this work, working, you know, pro bono when I was like 14, 15, 16 years old. I started taking on clients by the time I was 18, 19. I was doing executive coaching at 20. So I have literally been doing this work forever. How did executives respond to you when this 20-year-old young woman walked in the door and said, this is how you should lead your team? <laughs> I love that question. And one of the things that I've really cultivated is that my confidence doesn't necessarily need to be in me. It needs to be in my point of view. And my confidence in my point of view is 100%. I believe deeply in the work that I do and the impact that I can have. And so that's where my confidence always came from. It wasn't about who I am or, you know, look at me. And so I think coming in with that level of confidence was enough to really sway people, you know, like it, it was, I think, a big deal to have somebody so young walk in and say, I've never done what you've done but my point of view will change your life. And if you invest in that, right, you're getting everything that you need. I don't need to be able to build what you can build in order to know what I know. So you're a genius where you're a genius. I'm a genius where I'm a genius. And that point of view has taken me to really beautiful places because I've been able to stand in rooms with people who have built things that I can't even imagine yet building. But I know that my point of view stands alone and that has been a huge blessing for me. Was there an example where no matter how strong your conviction of your point of view that an executive or an organization just wasn't buying what you were putting down and how did you navigate that if so i think that you know there's been times that were tricky you know i was interviewing for a contract um 
again, in my mid twenties with a kind of hyper growth tech company, um, and ended up going through nine rounds of interviews. I think in many ways, because of my age, because my point of view was very different than what they thought they were looking for. I had a strong point of view, who you think you want is not who you actually want to do this contract, who you want is me. I ended up winning the contract. So that was a positive story. But, you know, I think that it's, it's less about people being open to me or my age over time and more that there's some people who want to do the work and some people who don't. There's some people who are ready to take accountability. And I'm sure you see this in your world as well, right? There's some people who are ready and willing to take accountability and some people who don't want to. And those people, you know, I could try to fight. I don't know that I would win. Um, I, you know, it's actually really funny. I had a client years and years and years ago and his daughter sent him and he very clearly didn't want to be there. And we spent two sessions arguing. And finally I said, you know, I really appreciate our time. Um, I'm going to give your daughter her money back. I don't feel comfortable taking her money. I don't feel like you want to be here. And he was like, yes, I do. I want to be here. And I was like, I hear your words. You're not ready. You didn't sign up. And I let him go and gave all the money back because I think some people really aren't open or willing or ready. And that's, and that's okay. You know? Hmm. As we referenced at the beginning of the show, you grew up the daughter of, I guess, a personal development guru by the name of Morty Lefko, and yeah. he was the president and founder of the Lefko Institute until he passed in 2015. And you referenced before, you know, growing up as a little girl in that kind of house and that environment. What's one of your earlier memories of your father either instilling some kind of personal development into you that you would later draw upon in your, you know, adult professional career or just anything that stuck with you that's profoundly impacted your life through your, I guess, adolescence and teens and into adulthood? Yeah. So I'm going to give two examples, one to kind of give each side of the coin. I have a memory of being in kindergarten and I had a teacher who I thought was mean to me. And I didn't like her because I thought she was mean. And I told my dad um, that she hurt my feelings and I was upset. And he asked what meaning I was giving her behavior. And he said, if you want to be upset, you can. I just don't know why you would want to be. If you change the meaning, you won't feel upset. And so I was introduced to these concepts really young. And it gave me this sense that my mind had power and that I could create my experience based off of my mindset. Now, the positive of that was it was very empowering. The negative was I was a little young. <laughs> so it I almost was introduced so early that I understood these concepts in a way where I, you know, didn't feel um like I developed necessarily enough of a relationship with my feelings and emotions at that age. But I think that was that was one example. But the the other thing was because of the way that my dad viewed the mind and how much power it has, right? That it gave me a lot of the conviction that I think I needed to build my career the way that I did. I understood from a young age that mindset is the difference between you having a great relationship and sabotaging it. If you believe you deserve love or you believe that you're undeserving, that's the difference between you walking away from something great. That if you believe that you are competent you will continue to persevere when you make mistakes. If you have a belief that you're not competent, you will likely give up. When I look at the choices we make, mindset is the difference between you having everything you want and sitting on the couch, feeling like crap about yourself, right? It's the difference between you overcoming hard things and not. And so there was a deep power in knowing that if mindset is everything, right? According to my dad, I, I agree in a lot of ways, right? That if mindset is everything, then infinite possibilities at our fingertips and suffering is optional if we know how to work through it. So those two examples for me really encapsulate what it was like growing up with my dad and what that kind of gave me professionally and personally. Did you try to lecture a seven-year-old when you were seven in the sand pit at the school playground <laughs> during lunch break? <laughs> I had no idea what to tell people my parents did for a living. They would say, what do your parents do for a living? And I'm like six years old. And I was like, my dad helps people eliminate negative beliefs about themselves in the world. They're looking at me like I'm crazy. And I was like, please don't ask what they do for a living. Please. I was like, couldn't they just be like a firefighter or a teacher? I had no idea how to talk about it outside of my family. 
did you witness the parents of your fellow schoolmates or school friends misbehaving? And could you identify very quickly as like a seven or eight or nine year old of oh, those adults there? The parents of my friend have a poor mindset. You know, what's what's really crazy more than that. I used to feel like I could see people's beliefs. Like it felt like in the matrix when it's like those green, you know, codes are coming down. It, I would watch somebody kind of need to steal the attention. And I would see what my dad used to call survival strategy beliefs, that if you believe you're not good enough and you believe that what makes you good enough is having people think well of you or getting attention or being liked, it was like I could watch their beliefs at play or if somebody always needed to be the smartest person in the class or was raising their hand, not because they wanted to share, but with that kind of eagerness of somebody who needs validation and being like, wow, that person, if they feel you know, not worthwhile or not important that they feel like they need to be the smartest or have all the answers to be important or worthwhile. So I had this sense, like I could see the matrix and I have a vivid memory of, it's funny that you talked about the playground of being outside. I think I must've been maybe eight or nine years old. I have this vivid memory of being like, I have to turn this off. Like I can't live, like I can't walk around seeing people's beliefs. Like it makes me, it's too much. And I remember turning it off and I could turn it back on, but it was like a, it was like a light switch. And I feel like through my life, that has been a, a huge gift because it was almost a little bit overwhelming to know too much when I didn't know what to do with it. And then also later in life, it's like when I'm with my friends, I don't want to be talking about their beliefs or I want to have friendships. And so being able to turn that off and then turn it back on when I'm in work mode has really served me because <laughs> it was really overwhelming. I can imagine. Your story kind of reminds me of the storyline of a Hollywood movie called Molly's Game back in 2017, where the, the lead character, a woman, um, builds an underground poker empire that she runs for Hollywood celebrities. And her father, again, is a very famous, well-known personal development type of coach. And it's a lot of the movie is is kind of like the, the conflict where she's trying to prove him wrong or herself right. And so, you know, obviously she can excel in any avenue that she chooses, but she just wow. happens to choose the most dangerous one, an underground poker empire. And the FBI investigates her. And there's like this father-daughter dynamic. I'm, I'm curious what you now in hindsight, looking back on your life and in particular your relationship with your father, what have you identified were possibly the negative consequences in later life, in adult life, as a result of being exposed to that personal development life and the matrix so young? Yeah, the hardest time for me was really out of adolescence, I think. I knew that our mind was so powerful and I understood the mind of everyone else and I understood the mind of myself. But as all of your listeners know, knowing the answers does not change behavior. And I didn't know how to use it on myself. And it was used in my family that if I was kind of misbehaving, I had to work on my beliefs. That was like a thing in our family of like, you you know can't treat us this way or you can't behave this way. You have to work on your beliefs. And I think because it was introduced so young, it was almost like I had developed around it and I couldn't get rid of my belief. I mean, there was like tens of thousands of people who were all like a hundred percent successful and it wasn't working on me. So one, I felt like I didn't belong in the family, which was a whole thing to unpack for many years that, you know, there was something wrong with me and that I was like a problem in our family because the process didn't work for me. And I was a liability for my dad and his work and, you know, their company. So it was a lot of heaviness for me surrounding that. But I think the hardest thing was having these beliefs and not being able to get rid of them, which turned my self-talk really, really dark. So there was a lot of like, what's wrong with you that you have these beliefs and you can't get rid of them. You're a problem. You're never going to make anything of yourself. If you don't get rid of these beliefs, you're doomed. You know, you're never going to be happy. You're never going to be successful. And so I just didn't know how to work that out in my own head. And I vividly remember being young and at night, just journaling my beliefs and trying to get rid of them instead of sleeping. It was like trying to figure out how to get rid of my, rid of my beliefs. And I couldn't, and I've always had a willful spirit, which got me through those hard times. And I've always 
kind of stayed on the path of self-development, but there was many, many years that were really hard for me. And even into my late teens and early twenties, I still really struggled to feel like I could overcome my own mindset. And it really wasn't until I think my late twenties, early thirties, when I really was able to slow down and be like, I need to find my own way of healing myself and all of my own stuff from my family and our, my own personal traumas, because this is not working, right? Like trying to use this on myself is not effective. Like I need to find something else. And I think that's a lot of what inspired me to really evolve my dad's work because the foundation is brilliant. I mean, his work is brilliant and it wasn't mine and it didn't resonate with me in a lot of ways. And so really looking at what did I have to use on myself and in my own growth? And then how can I use that with clients? So all of my own IP and my own body of work that kind of stands on the shoulders of giants, right? Rests on a lot of his principles and his ideology really came from that work, not being the end all be all because of my complex relationship to it. And there were times that I felt like I really hated the process and I hated his work because of everything that it had caused inside of me. I didn't say any of that out loud, but I held this resentment, um, which again, I, I just had to work through in my own ways and that, you know, had a lot of positive benefits for me professionally. Um, but it was really hard personally. Mm -hmm. And I guess in hindsight, you came to realize that that suffering was optional, but it's a process to get to that realization. And then once you've got that realization, what to do with it, right? Like, how do you actually get out of suffering if indeed we subscribe to the idea that it is optional? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I think from my perspective, if you don't understand how to unlearn your limiting beliefs, they will continue to bite you in the butt. And that doesn't mean that we can't use willpower. And that doesn't mean we can't be strong and overcome. But I have deep compassion from knowing what it feels like to know all the answers and not know what to do. And it almost feels to me that until somebody can help you see, or you have whatever the realizations are, until you have some tools or until you begin that unlearning process, the optional part doesn't feel so optional, right? So and I think that's part of why I'm so driven to make the impact I want to make is I know what it feels like, and I don't want anyone to feel the way that I felt. I don't want to leave it up to willpower or trying harder. I want people to understand the way their brain works, and I want them to start to unlearn the things that are keeping them stuck so they can be free because it's this exponential process. It's like once you begin, more becomes available, and once more is available, you have this positive kind of virtuous cycle and feedback loop, and so getting that process started is so core to my purpose and I believe why I'm on this planet. In a few minutes, I'd like to ask you some questions around uh, alcohol and why high performers like entrepreneurs and executives continue to consume this. And maybe we could look into what's the beliefs that that kind of demographic has. Obviously, this podcast, The Alcohol Free Lifestyle, and our coaching program, um, which is called Project 90, is a 90 day stop drinking program. And what we endeavor to do in that is uh, rewire our clients' mindsets uh, around alcohol. Or another way of saying it, to borrow your terminology, is to rewire their belief system. You know, challenge their current belief systems that they need alcohol to celebrate or to create romance or to relieve stress and anxiety. But just before we move on to that, you have worked with uh, the Google executive team, um, athletes, executives, entrepreneurs. What are some of the patterns that you've noticed? of ineffective beliefs or ineffective behavior when we're really sort of reaching that top echelon of peak performance? Yeah, it's a great question. So one of the things that I see is we get validated, especially as high achievers, we get validated for performing, producing, achieving, accomplishing. And so we will tie our worth and value to those things. And what, get you, what gets you to where you are is not going to get you to where you're going. So what happens is we start to say, I cracked the code, right? I know what makes me good enough, what makes me valuable, what makes me worthwhile, and it is these things. But the challenge is if you are hyper-focused on achieving, you're not creating 
ample space for experimentation. If you get your worth and value from being perfect, you're not giving yourself opportunities to do something that needs to get sent out at a 70, right? If you have content that needs to get out and you're looking for everything to be 100, you don't know how to be strategic we might understand that in order to be successful, we need to effectively delegate. But if we get our worth and value from doing everything by ourselves, because it got us to where we are, we become the bottleneck in our organization. And so what I see is the things that we were validated for early in life in school as people who are either really intelligent or worked really hard, we carry that into our business. And that is a fine way to start a business but it will ultimately become your biggest bottleneck. And one of the biggest problems is the stress that it causes. And this will ultimately be a really perfect segue into what you're talking about with drinking, but we experience often so much stress that comes from trying to hustle for our worth. And when you tie your worth and value again to achieving, accomplishing, doing it yourself, working hard, being busy, being productive, you are no longer in choice. It's not in this particular context, does it serve me to work really hard or does it serve me to take a break? Does it serve me to delegate or does it serve me to do it by myself? Does it serve me to do it at a 95 or does it serve me to do it at a 50 and send it off? When you are in choice, you will notice that the stress will dissipate. When you are hustling for your worth, that is a safety mechanism in your brain. You are creating this experience of fear and stress. Your brain is flooding with toxic neurochemicals that are cultivating this environment in your body that homeostasis will start to develop around. So you will now have a stressed out environment in your body, not just in your mind that you now have to fight against, which is incredibly unpleasant. Of course, people want to get out of that with drinking, right? Of course, people want to get out of that in so many ways. And so the first piece that I really encourage people to consider is if you are seeking validation for those things, one, understanding the consequences to your business how that might be a bottleneck in your business Two, under understanding the, the consequence to yourself and three, really considering what is the value that I want to provide? What is an integrity for me? What is my unique mission or goals? What is my genius zone? And the more you can focus on that, the less you seek that validation and the more you give yourself the space you need to do what's best for the business. Because the problem is we are not doing what's best for the business. We're doing what makes us feel better. And that's a really toxic cycle to be in. So I would say that's probably, that's probably the biggest thing that I see people getting stuck in. It also leads to burnout, right? If you are doing everything by yourself and working really hard, you get really burnt out and you lose your passion and igniting that passion once again really requires being able to work through that stress and those patterns of behavior. So seeking validation, if I'm hearing you correctly, is the biggest pattern that you see or the most frequent pattern. Folks who are seeking success or they feel like they need to do everything in their business or they need to do a certain part of their business or they need to be the face of their business, uh, I guess a limiting belief might be, for example, oh, just get out of the way. Let me do it. I'm the only one who can take care of this. Oh, geez, if you need something done, you got to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. I guess that I know that's come up with me over my entrepreneurial career where I uh, maybe have a mistaken belief that uh, I can do it better than anyone that I hire. Yeah. And so my my transformation recently in recent years has been um hiring outstanding people and then surrendering to get out of their way and let them do what they do without by previous need to be involved in every little minutiae decision making yeah. and to like check and double check and um so i would imagine that that's for me that's what's coming up for me as you're talking about that seeking validation i, I don't actually think that i need the validation of public notoriety or the face of the alcohol-free movement, even though I somewhat am to a degree in my business, um, I'm actually happy to be a, to get out of the way and just create massive impact. And I know that that will, you know, that's going to create a lot of joy. And I guess you could argue that gives me validation as well, right? Like the fact <laughs> that I can run a business without me being the face and still have have joy. I guess that's validation in a way. Yeah, you know, it's it's really personal. And I think that for some people, the validation is, 
not needing to ask for help. And for others, the validation is from being successful. And for some people, the validation is being a good person. And it's not that those things are bad. I would never tell somebody, stop being a good person or stop achieving, keep achieving, but be in choice about how that's expressed, right? Keep achieving, keep accomplishing, keep working hard, keep being productive, keep doing those things when it serves, keep being a good person, but do it for the right reasons. Don't do it because it feeds your ego. And I think the other thing that's really important that I want to highlight is there is only one trigger in the brain for fear, and it is a perceived threat to your survival. And whether that is mild anxiety, concern, worry, or terror, it's the same internal experience. And another thing that I see high achievers get stuck in is trying to do things right. The minute that we believe there's a right way and a wrong way to do things, we get caught in a cycle of anxiety. And the more we understand there's not a right way or a wrong way, there's my way, your way, his way, her way, right? We've all got our own way. And that's another piece when, you know, whether it's validation or trying to do it the right way, it's all that same energy of trying to overcome fear. And so the focus is external. It's either what's going to work, what's right, what's wrong, what am I going to get validated for, what are people going to think is smart or good enough or impressive or important or impactful or valuable, but it's all externally focused. And when we focus externally, that creates cycles of fear that will trigger the fear sensor in our brain that says my worth, aka my safety, those two things are inextricably linked for most people, is contingent upon an outcome. And so we're in these cycles of anxiety because we're outcome focused instead of process focused. Process focused is values, genius zone, not what other people think is valuable, but the value we want to provide. We focus on things like resonance and alignment. We focus on things like integrity. And so the more you can cultivate an internal focus of what is an integrity for me to build? What are my values? What is my genius zone? What am I uniquely capable of, right? For the person who hasn't yet worked through, I need to do it all myself. The more clear you are in your unique genius zone, the more you give others space to be in their genius zone. It's not the outcome of, could I do this one particular project better or not? Could I do this one particular path, task better or not? That's not the question. The question is, what are the things that give me energy? Because I think in so many ways, our most precept, precious resource is not money and it's not time. It's energy. And when we are doing things that drain us because we're good at it or because they feed our ego or because we get validated for them, we end up burning out. In contrast, when we focus on the things that give us energy, the things that unlock our passion and excitement, energy is not a pie. It's a renewable resource. You can have seven coins and after you do something, be down to two coins. You can have seven coins and after you do something, have 15 coins. So instead of asking the question, what gives me coins? What gives me energy? What unlocks my passion in doing that? If we're asking, what am I good at or what am I best at or what makes me feel good about myself, we are we're bleeding our energy, we're becoming depleted, and we're not looking clearly at a strategic vision. We're looking at a really ego-oriented business. Mm. Has an organization like Google figured this out? Or like, have, it's, that's just, Google is like what everyone recognizes, right? Like that's a marquee brand. It's known all over the world. Do they do something different that a lot of the other organizations that you work with do not, or do they have the same challenges as you just described? I honestly am blown away by some of their programs. I am so unbelievably impressed with some of the programs that they run internally that are founded on principles of exploration and experimentation, especially in their innovation lab. The way that they invest in their employees' mindset and support failure um, is impressive to me. So I think as an organization, they, they are ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. I will not speak objectively and say that they do everything right, but I will say in my experience, there's a lot of things that I have found to be particularly impressive. And I've worked with a lot of the kind of big kind of hyper growth tech companies, and some of them have cool programs in place, but I haven't seen anything anywhere else like what I've seen there. I was really, I've been blown away by a lot of their programs. And is what they're doing investing in employee mindset? And you also said supporting failure. So in terms of investing in employee mindset, why is that important? It's important because I think the greatest challenge we have is getting out of our own way. 
Hmm. in our genius zone without a fear of failure, without worrying what people think of us, without wondering if we're capable or competent or good enough, without having to prove ourselves, we are capable of truly incredible things. But the problem is trying to work through that voice in your head that's telling you that if you fail, you're going to humiliate yourself, or if you make a mistake, people will think you're not credible, or if you don't know the answer, you'll look stupid. That makes things really, really hard. And especially when we're in a culture where we believe that we are going to be rewarded for positive outcomes and potentially, you know, diminished as a brand or as an organization, if we make a mistake or fail, it feels like there's a lot on the line and there's a lot at stake. But the problem is we don't understand the nuance. We have to know where it's appropriate to fail and where it's not appropriate to fail. We have to understand how we manage failure. Failure is not black and white, right? It's a spectrum. And how we manage failure determines how it's perceived. It determines our credibility and the trust that we either gain or lose. Um, there's been a ton of research that shows that actually making a mistake or failing and owning it is one of the most effective ways of gaining trust. But we don't understand that. We don't behave that way. And so I think investing in mindset is, from my perspective, the single most important investment you can ever make. Because at the end of the day, your greatest investment is not in your business. It's yourself, the person you're becoming. The greatest asset you will ever have is the person you are becoming. They are capable of things that you couldn't dream of today. If I think of what I have accomplished today in comparison to where I was 10 years ago, the person I was 10 years ago could not run this business. The person I was 10 years ago didn't know what I know and couldn't do what I can do. And so when I realized, yes, I'm investing in my business, but more than investing in my business, I'm investing in the person I'm becoming because she, the one I'm becoming in 10 years is capable of things that today I can't dream of. And so removing, you know, Perry Marshall calls it head trash, like removing our head trash or removing our limitations or removing the beliefs, right? If, if we say something isn't on the table, we're not going to look for it. If I believe that it's impossible to get ahead without working myself to the ground, I will find ways of working myself to the ground, even if I don't need to, right? If I believe that in order to be productive, I have to be incredibly regimented, I might be somebody that really doesn't thrive in an overly regimented structure, but I will maintain that because I believe that that's the way I have to do it. So there's a huge lack I find of curiosity around who we really are and the conditions that we need to thrive because we're so focused on trying to get it right or trying to do what other people do or you know whoever was successful trying to follow their path. And it's not that we can't learn from the success of others but we are not that person. And the more you can understand your own limitations and your own genius, the more you get to unlock not just your success, but also the experience of enjoying your success, right? Of actually being able to be yourself and do what you're passionate about. As it relates to high performers and alcohol, how would one unlearn their belief system, which is alcohol helps me reduce stress and anxiety, alcohol helps me sleep, Alcohol is required to create romance. Alcohol is required when our team wins the championship so we can celebrate and spray champagne everywhere. Alcohol is required to do client uh, networking. Alcohol is related to win a business deal. Alcohol is, is needed to create a bond between friends and so forth and so forth and so forth. Now, there's a, a lot of cultural conditioning that goes on here in society. And I submit that it starts when your parents drink in front of you and you say, oh, no, little Brit or no, no, little James, you can't drink now. You can drink when you're older. And so it implants in the child's mind, oh, this is a rite of passage. This is something that I get to do when I'm an adult. That's where it starts in my, in, in my view. And then, of course, that's reinforced through college where you've got kids partying and have a good good time smiling assassins come from everywhere a smiling assassin is someone who's smiling as they offer you a drink hey would you like a drink let's have a drink oh geez i was drunk last night ha 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 so now we're associating this attractively packaged poison of alcohol with fun and connection and bond so i guess my question is knowing what you know about peak performance and helping high achievers to unlearn what they have learned how could we unlearn these beliefs around alcohol so we actually can choose an alcohol-free lifestyle 
Yeah, I love this question. I'm going to give you a few different answers. The first one is often the desire to drink is fueled by the idea that if we have boundaries, we'll look stupid. And I think that for a lot of people, they're afraid to say no because of what it will look like. And I think the reality is understanding that we respect people who have conviction. We respect people who know who they are and know what they want. And if you've ever looked at anybody in your life who has a clear boundary, I've asked this question to so many people. I say, what is the feeling or thought that you have? And they say respect. And so the first one is unlearning the idea that the way to gain respect is to do what other people want you to do. And instead understand that the most powerful way to gain somebody's respect is to have clear boundaries. And so once you decide what it is that you want, when you stand behind that with conviction, you're not looking stupid or like you don't fit in or like you don't belong. You're actually gaining the respect to say, I am a boundaried person. I'm not somebody who lays down under your tractor, right? I'm very clear of who I am. So that's the first one. The second one is very often we drink because there's an underlying feeling of not good enoughness or a lack of worth that we're trying to cope with. And I think that the more we understand that high achievers often feel like I can't handle those things. I need to focus. I need to focus on my business. I can't afford to feel my feelings. I can't afford to deal with my underlying stuff. And I think the reality is you can't afford not to, because right now you might be fine, but at some point these things are only going to grow, right? If there's a piece of cheese under the couch, it's not bad for the first week, but three years later, you're going to have a lot of mold under your couch, right? So I think this belief that I can't afford to feel my feelings. I can't handle it. I can't afford, I'm going to fall apart. I'm not going to be able to put myself back together. You still have your resilience. The resilience that you have gained in your life, you still have. It's not like you open Pandora's box and it all spills out and now you're the ocean and you're drowning. You can let it out a little bit at a time, but I think starting to focus on those feelings and starting to process things, you will find that when you're doing the work, I think alcohol will feel a lot less appealing. It's like after you go to the gym, you don't wanna eat a hamburger and a french fries. If you don't work out one day, it's like, oh, I want burger, a burger and fries and a beer. But after you work out really hard at the gym, the last thing you want is crappy food and alcohol. You want to eat a salad, right? You want to eat, you want to eat some, you know, good protein. It's the same thing with working on yourself. If you're not working on yourself, it's easy to want to cope. But when you're actively working on yourself, it's really inspiring. It's really empowering. And I think from that place, we're a lot less likely to want to cope and a lot more likely to want to figure out what is that underlying belief and how do I work through that? And I find that in that space, people want to feel into their power, not into coping. So that's number two. And the third thing I would say is very often, I think people drink to cope with fear. And I think being able to distinguish between unsafe and uncomfortable is a huge unlock. If I'm unsafe, I feel powerless. I feel small. I want to escape. I want to run away. When in contrast, we say, I'm not unsafe. There's no threat to my survival. For anyone listening to this podcast right now, you are not unsafe. The worst that it gets is this is uncomfortable. Now, uncomfortable might be really painful. Uncomfortable might be challenging. But I will be willing to bet there's not a single person who is listening to this podcast who has not dealt with uncomfortable and unpleasant things before. You have a process for dealing with uncomfortable and unpleasant. When you make the distinction between unsafe and uncomfortable, you no longer need to escape. You no longer need to run away. You no longer need to hide. It's just uncomfortable. I've done uncomfortable things before. Who do I want to be in my life? Do I want to be someone who can't manage uncomfortable? No, I want to be someone who can. And I think that's very empowering to face that discomfort and to work through it rather than running away. Again, the biggest asset you will ever have is the person you're becoming. Who do you want that person to be? How do they behave? How do they show up? How do they manage discomfort? And to practice dealing with the unpleasant trees in life and the discomfort we face from stepping outside of our comfort zone in a really different way. And then you'll start to see the benefits. And I think the virtuous cycle will kind of speak for itself. So one, know your boundaries and speak your boundaries as a way to gain respect. Number two, really understanding that the, the fears of working on yourself or opening Pandora's box, Pandora doesn't have a box, right? We're not living in a myth. It's one thing at a time. If you work on your stuff, you're going to feel empowered. You're going to want to better yourself. And I think you're not going to want to indulge in the same toxic behaviors. And then number three, 
if you're unsafe, you want to escape and you want to run away. But if you're just uncomfortable, the person you're becoming wants to manage that discomfort effectively. And so really leaning in and working through whatever it is that is outside of your comfort zone will help you cultivate the person you want to become. So that's that's what came up for me when you asked that question. Practically, let's just say we have a business owner or an executive and there's a corporate golf day on Saturday and there's an open bar. And after you've played some golf, you go back to the clubhouse. Booze is on us. Open bar. Okay. And everyone's there and there's the boss or the owner of the company or there are clients and you're networking. How does the gentleman or the uh, lady who is wanting not to drink because they're committed to an alcohol-free lifestyle, how does that person practically handle that situation when smiling assassins are everywhere going, here, have yeah. a drink. Would you like have a drink? Have yeah. A drink. Yeah. I would say you smile back even bigger. I'm good. Thank you. And if they ask, oh yeah, no, I don't drink because what you're communicating is I have values. I have goals. And I am unwavering in my commitment to them. How much are you showing of your character when you are clear that you will do hard things in order to go after what you want? So I think when someone's like, oh, no, 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 just have a drink. I think if you are very clear, one sentence answer, I'm good, thank you. And if they ask again, oh, no, I don't drink, you are communicating once again that you know who you are, what you believe in, and your goals and you are unwavering in your commitment. And I think that says volumes about your character and will definitely catch attention in a positive way that if it's noticed, you know, that that you are someone who's not to be reckoned with. Yeah, I like that. And I always say that it doesn't so much matter what you say, it more matters how you say it. Yes. And 93% of all persuasion and influence is body language, including tonality and pacing and um, shoulders back or forth or slumped forward or or, or back. And 7% of influence and persuasion is just the words that you say. So you could literally say anything that doesn't even make sense. You could just recite a line from a, from a movie, for goodness sake, as long as you've got this little smirk on your face or you're confident and you're like, oh, no, thanks. I'm good. I'm going to go and get drunk on this soda water, ice and a piece of lime. Ha, ha, ha. And that's it. And then that's like an energy transfer. The person who's witnessing this and experiencing this is go, oh, okay, this is a person who's strong in their conviction. And I always say it doesn't, no one's real, no one really cares if you are drinking or not drinking. They just care whether you're a fun, pleasant person to be around. That's that's really it. Let's do do another practical uh example, if if we may. Uh Someone's in a marriage, there's strain in the marriage. They're not communicating. They haven't learned conscious communication. Um, they're drifting apart. And both parties are seeking refuge in a bottle of wine each night to numb the pain of that, to procrastinate. They're finding some short-term relief from the pain of this discomfort of this strained marriage what would you suggest that they do differently to not turn to alcohol and to potentially face the uncomfortable conversation that might need to happen? Yeah. So the first thing I would say is, you know, putting band-aid, uh, putting a band-aid on an infected wound is not going to make the wound better. And so really looking at what do I want most and being able to focus on what I want most over what I want now. And here's how I would get started. Here's what I would say practically. I would say something like this. I have no idea how to make this better. I have no idea what to say. I have no idea what to do. I don't know how to do this well. I don't know how to do this right, but I want to try. Are you willing to try to have these conversations that we don't know how to have? It's okay to point out that you don't know what you're doing. I think the, the core of beginning is starting where you are and not starting where you want to go and being curious around what works and what doesn't, right? We often as a society like to give formulas and five-step processes and strategies. The reality is we're all different. We all have different skills and different wounds and different desires. So I think beginning where you are and calling out I know I can tend to get defensive and I imagine that's hard to deal with. And I'm going to try to not get defensive, but I might get defensive. So if I get defensive, just, you know, let me know in a nice way, like raise your hand or have a sign or say banana or something. And I'll try to come back to not being defensive. Call yourself out 
where are the places that you are likely to sabotage your progress? And how can you call yourself out and get that support? Now, that doesn't mean you're going to communicate beautifully. I will even say within myself, you know, I had a lot of blocks around needing to be perfect. When I was young, I was validated constantly for being impressive. Like, oh my God, you're seven. You seem like you're 35. So these really huge compliments. You're so wise. You're so smart. You're so incredible. And that seems like a really great thing. But to me, it did not feel great. It felt overwhelming. It felt like I had to perform. It felt like I needed to be perfect. And it was incredibly stressful. So I never felt like there was space for me to be imperfect. And so if I was in an argument or a conflict, I would completely shut down because it made me feel like I wasn't perfect and therefore I wasn't good enough and I wasn't lovable and I was a failure and I couldn't have challenging conversations. I would completely disappear and shut down. And what I learned was I needed to start where I was. I, I literally took the advice that I'm giving to all of your listeners right now of calling out my weaknesses, calling out my challenges, saying the hard things. And I have a memory, you know, it took me a while to get good at this and I'm still human. I still have challenges, but I have a memory. I was really withdrawing. I was in an argument with my husband and I was really withdrawing and I, we were laying in bed and I turned away from him. And I was turned away and I was like, Brit, turn back, turn back, turn back, turn back. Like you don't, you don't want, and I, I couldn't get myself to turn back. And finally I'm laying over there and I was like, I'm turned away and I don't want to be turned away. And I feel really bad and I want to turn back and I don't know how. And it began the conversation and it allowed me to ultimately turn back and for us to have a really great communication. So my advice would be start where you are, call out your weaknesses, let your partner know where you are likely to self-sabotage and work through it in a really honest, rocky, imperfect way. Mm. And then finally, one more practical situation. Our clients often say, oh, I won't drink, but I'll just have a drink on a special occasion. And what we attempt to do in our process is to help rewire our client's mindset to a degree where they realize that outstanding health all the time is the special occasion that every moment and every day that they are alcohol free and their natural expression is being unleashed that's the special occasion as opposed to oh it's my son's graduation day i guess that's a special occasion let me have a drink oh my team won the championship special occasion oh it's a wedding i'm going to a special occasion so how would we change the belief that alcohol is worthy of being described as something special and something that we would consume on a special occasion? Yeah, it's a great question. I think even the idea of special occasion is a little bit fractured. What do you ultimately want in this life? Do you want to have a bunch of special occasions or do you want to have a robust, meaningful, fulfilling life that's filled with purpose and health? So I think, yes, special occasion, but in comparison, if what I want most, again, the person I am becoming is the greatest investment I will ever make. How do I want to feel? What do I want my life to look like? And if what I want most is to feel alive, empowered, proud of myself, confident, clear-minded and healthy, what is a special occasion in comparison to that? Like a couple, you know, a couple candles and a cupcake. It's right. It's like, so I, I almost would even say, I don't think a special occasion is that special. I think having a life that you are proud of, that you love, I think that's special. I think that's worth fighting for. And so the little moments along the way, let them be special because they're a part of your beautiful life, not because they're a special occasion, right? Let your life be special. Let everything be special. Some of the most special moments in my life have not been birthdays or contracts closed, right? They've been sitting with my husband, watching the sunset and just thinking, I can't believe I'm so lucky. Like, I can't believe that I live in a world that is so beautiful that nature has gifted me with this sunset. And I have this amazing husband that we've cultivated something so beautiful or, you know, talking to my friend on the phone when she's going through a hard time and just being like, God, how am I so lucky to have this intimacy in my friendships where my friends trust me to come to me with their, with their hardships and knowing that they're there for me or laughing about absolutely nothing on a random Tuesday. To me, what makes life special is the intimacy and the passion and the accomplishments that we believe in, 
not winning or signing a contract or a birthday. And it's not that those aren't special, but they're special because your life is special, not because they're a standout moment. If you can't celebrate your life, why celebrate a special occasion? Well said. And I would imagine that that celebrating your life is special all the time creates these infinite possibilities, which you referenced at the beginning of our conversation. It gives us this expansive view of the universe, I would imagine. A hundred percent. It The exploration of infinite possibilities really asking, what did I take off the table? Right? Where did I say joy? This is the most, this is the most joy. Who said, what would it feel like to push the envelope a quarter of an inch further, right? This is the most I can achieve. This is the cap on my earning potential. This is how great a relationship can be. This is how close your friendships can be. This is how strong you can be. This is how powerful you can feel. This is how passionate you can be. Who said that's the most? What is the most, right? We live in an infinite universe. Why not push the envelope? And whether it be with goals or with achievements or with feelings, infinite possibility from my from my vantage point is exploring everything that you have taken off the table because it's not possible. It's too hard. It's not feasible because it's for everyone, but you who said, and as we put these possibilities back on the table, we start asking different questions. If we believe getting from 5 million to 10 million is going to be hard, we are now creating an experience of hard. But if we ask the question, if I knew it was going to be the easiest thing I've ever done, what would I think of? How would I address the problem? Who would I ask for help? Where would I begin, right? If I say a loving, intimate marriage is impossible, well, great, now I'm not gonna create it. But if I say a loving, intimate marriage is absolutely possible, how do I wanna go about creating it? Where do I begin? How do I communicate? If what I want is to live an alcohol-free life filled with joy and passion and vivacity, I'm now going to ask the question, what does that look like? Where do I begin? If I say it's not possible to be happy without alcohol, that's where I'm drawing the line. And so infinite possibility is the exploration of everything outside of what we have deemed possible or feasible. And when we open up the space that that possibility only exists outside of our mindset, not outside of possibility, we start asking different questions and we engage differently. And that is when we pull toward us the things that are truly surprising and amazing beyond what we had historically thought we were able to have in this life. Britt Lefko is one of the top business and personal development coaches in her field. She's an executive coach for Fortune 10 companies and works with high achieving entrepreneurs, executives and organizations that understand that mindset is key to their success. If you would like to Learn more, you can go to brittlefko.com. That's B-R-I-T-T-L-E-F-K-O-E.com. Is there anywhere else where our viewer and listener can connect with you, Britt? I would say, yeah, just go to brittlefko.com. If you're interested in booking a call and you're interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching, I would love to talk to you. I sometimes run other programs. So yeah, go ahead and shoot me an email or book some time if you're interested in coaching. Um, my Instagram is a lot more personal than professional. It's me in the mountains. I love the mountains. So if you want some beautiful mountain pictures, it's just Brit Adventures. Um, again, more personal than professional. But yeah, go ahead and uh, go to brittlefko.com and I would love to connect with you. Well, Britt, thank you so much for sharing your guidance and uh, expertise and I uh, really appreciate you sharing uh, some personal things about your childhood and growing up as well. I really appreciate your vulnerability there and uh, it's been a real gift for me and I'm sure for our listeners to spend some time with you here today. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me.